What I'm going to do is um, give a, a bit of an overview of some of the practicalities of, uh, of FWI. Um, what are the things that, uh, that are really important to remember wh when you do it um, on, on a cluster of uh, workstations, for example, or a, 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 a big uh, supercomputer, um, or even, even on a local machine? Um, what are the things that are really important? Um, and one, one of the things, and, and that will form a kind of introduction to, to uh, what uh, Jared will be saying later on. Um, I won't be spending too long on this. We'll go through it fairly quickly. Um, I want to leave Gerald plenty of time to talk about all the things he has to say. Um, but earlier on this morning, uh, Mike um, showed us a slide which, ha which had a, a kind of set of stages, seven stages for FWI. Um, and, and I've taken that and, and used it as, as a basis for explaining some of the things that are important. Um, so we're going to take these, each of these seven stages and unpack them see what's involved at each stage, um, and look at some of the practicalities uh, of each one. So just as a reminder, field data, we need, we've got the starting model and the source. Uh, we're wanting to do a formal model. Um, we're forming residuals, backpropagating, cross-correlating in some form. Um, there's a step length calculation, which involves another forward run, rather like stage two. And then we take the updated model and we iterate. What does that look like practically? Well, okay, obviously it's not selected. That's better. Right, um, so first of all, a few key questions before we actually um, move on to that. Uh, we're going to be probably likely to be running these uh, computations in parallel. So that means across several nodes, uh, maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands. Uh, so how do we go about parallelizing this particular problem? Um, there are the crudely speaking, there are two methods that we can use. We can take our computational domain, we can split it across the nodes, the processes that are doing the computation, uh, or we could take each shot, uh, we could run that uh, each shot on a node um, or a process. Um, and this, this is probably the easiest to code. Uh, I think it's the most straightforward in many ways um, in the time domain. In the frequency domain, when you, have, when you have large matrices to solve, you might end up wanting to do this. Um, also, on each node, we have multiple cores. We have, um, uh, these days, often um, 20, tw something like 20 cores in a node. Um, so we want to be able to use multi-threading. Uh, we want our code to be multi-threaded um, on, this, uh, on these, these clusters. Um, so looking at each of these stages, then, some key considerations, some key questions to ask. Uh, and I think here are, here are some of them. So first of all, what is the data that we need at, at this particular stage we're looking at? How big is the data? How much is there? Um, where is this data held at the moment? Where do we actually need it to be to perform this particular stage, the computations inv involved in this stage? What are the computational costs? That's going to be a, a major one that we'll, uh, we'll consider at the moment. Um, and Gerard is, in particular, going to be looking at uh, some ways that, that he's, um, he's uh, using at the moment to to create code that can, that can help with this. Um, what is the output from this stage? How much output is there? Uh, so these are, are some of the key questions that we want to have a brief look at. So first of all, stage one, the field data, starting model, the sources. Um, first of all, we have this seismic trace data. We call it the observed data. And we have this for each shot. And I'm going to start using some mathematical notation here for, uh, for some of the different objects that we come across. Um, and I'm going to call this D. And for shot K, it's DK. Um, so we have starting model, um, a set of parameters that define our starting model, our, um, our uh, P wave velocity, for example, uh, our uh, anisotropic parameters, so epsilon, delta. Uh, maybe we're doing elastic, in which case we've got a shear wave model. Um, density we may have, um, and Q maybe. But let's start with just the, the P wave velocity model. That's the general um, starting point that we have with some kind of density model in there, perhaps. We have source, a set of source wavelets, which, as we heard this morning, may not be known at the start, um, possibly. Um, and I'm going to call this, uh, this S. And again, it's over shots, so it's S subscript K. Um, and typically, these are held in files on disk. Uh, and there may be an awful lot of trace data. Um, perhaps we'll be 
uh, only using a, a subset of a few, uh, a few gigabytes out of terabytes of data. Um, we may only be using gigabytes for each iteration of this loop. Um, at this particular stage, there's very little computation going on. It's mainly getting the data from the disk to where we're going to be performing the computation in the next stage. And um, this is where we do what we often call a forward model, where we're, we're literally taking the, the, um, the, the data that we have, uh, taking the uh, model parameters that we have, and, um, and we, uh, uh, this data, the, the model parameters and the source wavelets, they have to be on the nodes um, in RAM, um, performing some kind of um, operation uh, so that we can perform some kind of matrix solve, which looks something like this. So a matrix which depends upon our initial model, M, and we have a source wavelet on the right-hand side, uh, which goes onto the right-hand side, and this is what we're after, are these wave fields, predicted wave fields, um, over the computational domains, uh, and again, this is for each particular shot, K, so we have U subscript K um, in each, uh, on each, uh, for each shot. So this is our predicted, our predicted wave field, which is over the whole domain, and then what we do with that is we form residuals at the receivers. So we want to sample this predicted wave field U at the receivers uh, for each shot. So we typically have some kind of um, sampling operator. Um, sometimes we call it the picking matrix. It's some kind of reduction to, the, uh, to the, uh, the receiver points, which takes the wave fields U uh, for the particular shot K and reduces it to the receivers. So uh, we have just the data um, that we've predicted at the receivers. And we want to compare this with the observed traces. So um, we would, might do something like just take the straight difference, for example. That's the simplest thing to do. There are lots of other more complicated things that we could do, but let's stick with just taking a difference. Um, and we obviously need to bring this data uh, together. The, the observed data needs to be um, where it can be compared with this, uh, this predicted data and uh, for each particular shot. Uh, there's very little computation is going on at this stage. Um, it's, um, uh, we're just having to do a reduction operation, fairly straightforward. And what we get at the end of this is a set of residu what we call residuals at the receivers for each shot. So it's, uh, in this case, a simple difference between, um, between the observed data here and the predicted data here. And I've called this R, uh, subscript K for shot K. Um, as I said, it's uh, at this stage very little computation for that. The main computation we had um, has already happened uh, so far in, st in the previous stage uh, was performing this particular solve here, which if it's in the frequency domain, this um, would be a kind of Helmholtz operator. Um, if it's in the time domain, you'll typically have time stepping, stepping through the, the time steps. So stage four. Um, and this is where, again, we meet um, one of the major computational costs that we have involved in FWI. So stage two was the forward modeling. This is the back propagation. This is the second major cost that we have. Um, uh, we need to take those residuals that we just calculated uh, for each shot, and we need, we're also going to need the model parameters. And we have to, again, have that data where the computation is actually going to take place on the nodes. And um, again, major computation we're doing an adjoint calculation. Uh, so we have the adjoint operator here. And uh, it's, uh, again, it depends upon the, the model parameters that we, we have. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have uh, sources. We have a, a right-hand side source, which comes from the, the residuals that we calculated. And this is spread uh, using the transpose of the reduction operator that we had before. Um, the, uh, this this is, uh, ends up producing a right-hand side which covers the whole domain, but which is um, just localized where it's non-zero, is localized to the points near the receivers. So this acts as a right-hand side source for this equation. And again, it's a, a similar kind of thing to what we had before. In the frequency domain, uh, uh, the transpose of a Helmholtz operator. In the time domain, it's uh, typically time-stepping, backwards-stepping, because we're, we're taking a transpose. So that's why it's called back-propagating. Um, and what this gives at the end is uh, the back-propagated wave fields, what I've called V here. Again, V subscri subscript K uh, for, for shot K. And this extends over the whole computation d computational domain 
uh, for each particular shot that we're, uh, we're try we've modeled in the, uh, at stage two. So we have, we have this, the key things to remember are the, is, is this VK that we have here and the U that we had before, which was the forward wave field. Because at stage five, what we're going to do is a, a form of cross-correlation of these two particular um, objects. Uh, so we need the wave fields from the forward, which is UK, and we need the wave fields from the back propagation, which is VK, for each particular shot K. Um, there's not a lot of computation involved in this. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's essentially cross-correlating these two, uh, these two um, wave fields with something thrown in the middle, which is a differential of your... Um, your operator, uh, your wave field, your um, wave equation operator, um, differential of the operator at the current model parameters. So you're differentiating with respect to the model um, at the current model parameter. And what this gives is an unscaled model update uh, for each particular shot. So I've called that delta m. Uh, it's an update to your model m, and it's for each each shot. So delta m subscript k. Um, and again, so far, this is on, uh, on the nodes, wherever it is that you've, you've done the, these the previous calculations uh, for the forwards and, and back propagated. Um, and you want to bring this information together in some way to produce a global um, update for your model. And again, so far, it's unscaled. It, uh, what we know so far is this is only a direction that we want to step in. We don't know how far we're stepping in it. So it's, it's an update direction. Uh, so it's an unscaled update. Um, and this is global, so we want to take the information from all the nodes, all the shots, um, and stack it in some way uh, to give a global, uh, a global update uh, that's uh, update direction. Step six, the step length calculation. Again, this is the third, uh, the third stage at which we actually have some uh, major computational cost involved. The other was stage two, where we had the forward model and stage four, where we had the back propagation. Stage six, the step length calculation. Essentially, it's a repeat of the forward model, but with an updated uh, set of model parameters, where we take the, the model parameters and um, we apply the, update the model update direction that we had. We use that as a perturbation to the current model parameters. We move it a, a small amount in that direction. Um, I've called this big delta M. Uh, and then we run the forward again with this updated model. So again, a Helmholtz operator or um, time stepping um, to get a new set of wave fields for each particular shot. Uh, you can see we have the, the right-hand side source, the source wavelets again on the right-hand side there, as we used before. This um, then goes on to form a new set of residuals, which I've called R dash, uh, very similar to before, just taking a, diff a simple difference in this case. Um, so what we need on the nodes where we're actually performing this computation is um, we need to have the data for the source wavelets. We need to have uh, the updated model um, on the nodes for this particular computation. Again, as I've said, major computation here, um, like stages two and stages uh, four. Um, and then what, what happens next is, is that we want to compare these new residuals, R dash, against the previous residuals, just R, as I called them. Um, and that will be used to give a scaling, this scaling factor alpha, which tells us how much of delta M, the model update, we want to add to our model. Um, and this, this will be uh, the way that we know how far to step um, in that direction. So um, that is basically the end of what we've got to do. Um, the next stage is the final one, which is just to to apply that update and then um, go back and continue the iterations. Uh, so we will need to push this new, uh, this new delta M to the, uh, to the, uh, to the nodes, wherever, wherever they, uh, whichever nodes need it uh, for, to perform the operations at the next stage, which reminds me I should have mentioned that at stage, stage um, Stage five, yes, at stage five, when, we, when we've done, um, we have produced a, an unscaled model update for each shot. And as I mentioned, this needs stacking across the shots. So um, you can think of this rather like a, a blocking operation if you're doing, doing it in parallel. Um, th there's, 
uh, a synchronization stage, or, uh, you can think of it like here, where you're having to synchronize, um, you're having to stop and collect everything from the nodes um, that are performing these calculations and turn it into a, a stacked um, global update. So this is a point during our parallelization in which everything suddenly stops, we collect information, and then we carry on to stage six. Um, I think there are probably some better ways to do that. Um, I don't know if, Gerard, you, you're not going to touch on any of that, are you? No, okay. I think there may be some possible ways to, to do better than that, but, uh, but that's, that's quite an important point where um, effectively things stop and you, you're doing a stacking operation across the nodes to get that global update um, and then to, then to carry on um, to perform the step length calculation at uh, stage six and then stage seven, iterate. Um, I think that uh, largely wraps up what I want to say, just a, a few of the practicalities of the, diff uh, the different stages. Uh, but as you can see, the major computational costs that we have were at stages two, four, and six, the forward propagation, um, four being the back propagation, and six being a second forward propagation for a step length calculation. And I think Gerald is going to now take that up and talk about um, some ways to, uh, to improve um, that, uh, the efficiency of that comp those computations.